People used to always say, if you can't find them, grind them. That was some old little transmission saying we used to have in the day. Anyway, obviously that meant that your synchronizer rings weren't working, and what the hell, just keep on plowing through the gears. I did this little short video clip on how synchronizer rings work. Check it out. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube page at gearworld.tv. Thanks for watching. Okay, I got a pile of different synchronizer rings here. Let me put these later style ones aside and let's get to the early stuff first. There we go. This is a typical Muncie four speed synchronizer assembly. Uh, this is your hub. This is your slider. These are your strut keys. These are your springs. Some people call these shift dogs, energizing keys. It's all the same stuff. Anyway, the hub attaches to the output shaft, which attaches to your rear wheels. So think of this part as always turning with the rear wheels, with the car, so to speak. This is your slider piece. This fits on here like this. This is what engages your speed gear to the hub. It locks it. So the gear is kind of floating in the transmission like this. Your synchronizer ring will lock the gear in place. Then the power goes from the gear to the hub to the output shaft. But we can't do that without a synchronizer ring because this gear has to be able to match, match the speed of this hub so that the two can work together so you get a nice clean shift without any grinding. This is where the synchronizer ring comes into play. So when you put a synchronizer assembly together like this one, as I'm going to do, I'm going to do a 3-4 piece here. You simply drop the hub in there. These particular assemblies have hardly any rock to them. The slider does not rock on the hub, which is what we want. I actually have them mark with a magic marker here, the way I like them to fit the best. I'll sort, I'll sort through the transmissions parts and get pieces that fit together smoothly with no rocking. Your strut key has a little bump on it. There's many different types of strut keys. Some have bigger bumps, smaller bumps. Some are made of stamped steel. Some are made bigger, thin, or whatever. And what I do is I simply take this and I start them like this. People get confused often how to do this. Pretty much a lot of synchronized assemblies are put together this way. For top loader goes like this, the T10, the Tremac TKOs, it's all the same way. Notice what I'll do too is tang of the spring is here, wraps around this way. I flip the synchronizer assembly over, start on the same strut and put the spring in that way again. So what I have is a good balance. In other words, spring is going this way, spring is going that way. That's also why I mark these. So now we notice <clears throat> with this is that the, the springs allow the strut to kind of keep some pressure against the outer slider. So they kind of track with the slider and that's what we want. Okay, let's get a close up so I can show you what's going on here. You have your strut key, you have your spring, and you have your engagement teeth. You notice the synchronizer ring has a slot in it that'll fit right into where that key is. Okay, so if you look at what's going on here, you'll notice that if the ring is going counterclockwise, it'll never end up point to point, and if it's going clockwise, it never ends up point to point with the slider. They always end up kind of flank to flank or side to side. So what happens if the ring is going this way, in order for the slider to go past it, it has to push the ring in the opposite direction. So here, the ring has to go that way for the slider that comes through. So this may be like say on an upshift, then on a downshift, maybe this way. So the ring has to go the same thing. It has to go in the opposite direction for the slider to come to and engage the gear. Now keep in mind, this is going to happen very fast. This action that we see here, this indexing action, it's going to happen in a split second when you're power shifting your car going really fast. So the idea is, if a ring's wearing over here in the slot, and it allows the ring to travel, or over travel, or over index, as I like to call it, you'll end up with a point-to-point -point condition where the ring will go like this. 
straight up against the slider. Or sometimes these teeth can get really mashed. They can get really mashed over from somebody missing a shift and flattening the teeth out. And as a result, it's not going to allow the slider to come over the ring or the ring to index properly, which is what I call a blockout condition. So when you get a blockout condition, what happens is the ring ends up point to point. And you get people complaining that it doesn't grind in gear, but it just blocks out and doesn't want to go into gear. So when you have a blockout condition, it's because this indexing motion isn't working correctly. Could be the slot is worn out. Could be that it's open up and allowing the ring to travel. It could be that the key slot in the hub has been hammered out. This happens on a lot of four top loaders that people don't pick up. This key slot gets wider from where, and then the key can move, and the whole thing goes out of index. So it has nothing to do with the actual ring being bad. If you look at the teeth on the ring, a lot of times people will look at the synchronizer teeth on the ring, and they go, oh, the ring is bad because these teeth are worn. And that really has nothing to do with the ring being worn. Again, it has to do with how it effectively grabs the cone of the gear. Here we have a gear. This is a new gear and a new ring and how they fit. Again, it's a cone clutch, just like this. And the ring fits on this cone and causes an interference fit. When pressure is applied, it grabs the gear and turns it in a direction. Now that we know how this works over here, it will only allow it... I'm going to exaggerate this in a way. So if the gear is going like this, it's only going to allow it to stop and have to blip backwards slightly like this for the ring to come through it. So if you think about it, being that all these gears are in constant mesh in a transmission, what's going to happen is, is the whole gear train literally has to get blipped slightly backwards. And you have backlash in it, but when you think about the mass of the gear train and what's going on, it has to blip exactly backwards, ever so slightly. Now let's look at some other rings here. This is a gear. This is a used gear, used ring. You see the height of this ring, the gap here. This is still an acceptable height. But this ring isn't grabbing the gear anymore. It looks good. The teeth look good. But I can put pressure on here as much as I want. Here I am doing this by hand at a very slow speed. And I cannot grab this gear and make it, make it really lock onto it. Again, let's look at the gap here. Still not bad. Let's put a new ring on here. We can see that the gap is slightly higher. But I put pressure on it. it, locks right onto the gear. So again, sometimes you can look at a ring. This is an older ring. The new rings now come with oil slots to displace oil better and make them shift faster. But if we look at the threads of the ring, the threads are worn. The threads are flattened out a little bit and they're not biting into the gear. Also, that they're not cutting through the oil film that's on the gear. So on my right is the T10 gear, on the left is the Muncie gear. Now if you look at a Muncie ring compared to a T10 ring, they have the same identical diameter on the outside, 36 teeth. Okay, People always ask, so why does the Muncie shift better than the T10? It's the cone. When GM redesigned the T10, what they did was put larger cones. Here, if you look on the Muncie gear, the cone is slightly larger than the T10 gear. Now, why did they do this? They did this because when they beefed the T10 up, they used larger gears with more mass. And the engineers felt that they needed a little bit more braking power on the cone of the gear to stop it because of the inertia. Think about it. It's all these gears getting bigger, not just one gear. And therefore, the whole mass itself is spinning faster. And they needed a better biting. So what they did was they made the ring cones. Again, they both look the same. But the Muncie cone is bigger than the T10 cone. All right, let's get a closer look at synchronizer rings. This is the old bronze unproven synchronizer ring that we see in T10s, Muncie's, four top loaders, Chrysler AA33s and the TKO, even the Richmond 5 speeds and 6 speeds. It's been around forever. So why do they come up with these new rings like this? This is a T5 world class synchronizer ring, typically used in first and second application. If you notice, the ring has an outer shell, I call it, a lining, and then an inner cone. So it's a three-piece ring. 
If you look at this ring compared to this ring, of course this looks much smaller. But the reality is that this synchronizer has about 14% more surface area than this ring because of the dual surface. So what they've been able to do is make a smaller ring having less mass and less inertia have more stopping power than a larger ring. So if you think about the T5 having smaller gears with a ring that has about 14% more surface area an old, than, a, than the older ring, it becomes a really nice shifting transmission. The 3-4 rings uh, on the T5's wall class, they have a lined ring that's bonded as well. These are powdered metal or sintered iron rings. Uh, they do this because they can actually form this in one shot without any machining and then bond the lining to the, uh, to the ring. These work very well. Now the important thing to know is that any of these bonded type of rings you need to have the correct oil to fill in the pores of the, of the lining so it, it stays cool and at the same time can get out of the way. Using gear lube with any of these linings will cause them to burn up, for example. This particular ring is just a larger version of this ring. This is used in the T56. Same deal. Outer shell, lining, and inner cone. Now you notice how big this ring is. They've designed this ring to be this big, obviously to hold more surface area for bigger stopping power needed because the T56 has quite uh, a set of larger gears and because it's a six-speed, six again all in constant mesh, more inertia. So if you look at this lining, you can see the way the paper is shaped on it. They've designed this specifically to work with certain oils like the GM Synchro Mesh Fluids or Pennzoil Synchro Mesh Fluids. So obviously these little grooves will hold the oil in place yet move out of the way enough to allow the ring to grab the gear and the comb. They've incorporated that design now on the T5s. The new T5-1-2 synchronizer ring comes with the same linings that the T56s have. Uh, they're identified actually, a lot of people don't know this, so you don't confuse them. There's a little green dot over here because they've actually changed the cone angle. If I take this cone and put it on the, the newer style, it'll wobble, it won't fit right. So it's, it's important that you never mix them up if you are building world-class transmissions. Always keep the later style ring assemblies together, never mix the early to the late. This is a, a gear and a synchronizer ring in place on a main shaft. This is a typical Muncie main shaft. This is the second speed M22 gear. And here we, I'm going to show you, this is the gear, how it would be in neutral, just floating around like this. Notice again that the ring is tracking with the gear on those keys, going back and forth like this. So if the ring is spinning, I'm sorry, if the gear is spinning this way, or the, ring, or the gear is going this way, the ring is tracking with the gear, but being held in place by those keys. So what happens is, again, we want to make that shift. For it to do this, this ring has to stop and go in the opposite direction. So if the gear is going this way, it's going to have to blip slightly back that way for the slider to go in. So again, if you think about it, when a transmission grinds going into gear, that means that this ring here doesn't have the ability anymore to stop this gear because of the wear on the inside of the ring, or maybe the guy's got a bad clutch release or something like that's going on. So what happens is, again, when you have to do this at a very fast speed, just think, this is not just one gear spinning, because it's connected to all these other gears on the main shaft. And we're expecting this ring to blip that whole gear set in a split second and match it to the speed of this slider, which is attached to the output shaft. So, see so if I just put my thumb on here. That's it. That's how rings work.